Okay, all right. So um, we have a couple of things to talk about before we get started. Um, some of you, or most of you, should know at this point that we had an amazing, uh, interesting, and unexpected event in our health center this weekend. Um, a sprinkler main broke on the first floor. It blew out. We had a flood. It knocked out at elevators, and uh, we had standing water on the first floor and the zero level. Um, we had eight residents that we relocated uh, throughout, and we were fortunate that we had the appropriate beds for them, so they're in the right level of care. Um, we had Surf Pro, the fire department, and anyone else that Nathan knows in Durham that does anything to fix everything there. Um, and all of the staff were in. Uh, we have gotten most of it dry. The elevators, I think, are on manual service still, are they? They're on intermittent service, that is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this, let's not commit. Um, and uh, so, but we are able to move people around. We were able to move around the cabin, as it were. Um, but we do know that uh, we, we've appreciated that people have restrained and kept from visiting. And we will restore visitation tomorrow at noon. Um, don't all rush at once. Um, and we are asking that people come in through the second floor. We can't go in on the first floor. Um, we are able to deliver food because, heaven forbid, that we miss a meal at the forest. So the service elevator works. We're able to get food up to all of the floors. Everybody's eating. Nobody's missed a meal. We're going to bring Jenny in from here to home, who will move people's possessions upstairs to the new rooms that they're in. I expect people to be relocated for at least 30 days, if not six weeks. However, the good news is, and this is where I want us to thank our blessings, because there's a blessing in all of this. It could have been, under the old system, we would have had to evacuate the entire health center. But because we were able to keep the sprinkler on and separate, because we were able to do a limited fire watch, because we were able to intermittently man the elevators, the fire department did not make us do that. So while something failed, the good news is we have a better building than we would have had had it happened elsewhere. Um, and no one was harmed. There was minimal damage to two resident rooms. And the other thing is, we have insurance. We have good insurance. We have lots of insurance. And so um, we're just hunkering down and getting everything fixed. Life will go on. We've, we will have temporary pathways, and we'll continue to do. Jen Key is really good at making up stuff and making stuff happen. Um, and uh, just appreciate, Leanne, I appreciate so much your team uh, for all that they have done. I, it was just amazing to watch people, and I thank the leadership team who basically showed up um, and just kept things going. But our residents are in a good place. Um, and yes, it's hectic and it's different, but there's no service interruption, um, and uh, we'll, we'll get through this, and we'll be fine. So, but I just wanted to let you know in detail, you can write more memos, but the more memos I write, the more other answers I hear. And so we're all here, you've all heard it. Um, and we'll keep you posted if there's anything else right now. Um, but right now it's kind of business as usual. If you have an extraordinary circumstance, somebody you need to see or there's something going, please contact Leanne um, and she will make sure that it happens, okay? and we'll just keep working with you. And if you see something or notice something or something, ask somebody, but please don't fill in the blank, okay? Thank you. So today, I wanna to welcome you to our executive staff update, and I wanna start by acknowledging some folks that I'm looking and I'm not seeing, but I do have the chairman of our board, our governing board, Chuck Kennedy, is here tonight and has joined us. And I don't see our three resident members. Craig Daniels here? No, Ed Embry and Jim Friedman. Well, those are our three resident board members, but Chuck, you're it, okay? Um, and uh, for those of you who have never been here before for an executive staff update, that is something that occurs um, <clears throat> twice a year. Uh, and I welcome you to that. The reason we do that, it's part of the DOI, or Department of Insurance statute, and during the mid-year, uh, we usually talk about operations, what, what's going on, what's happening, et cetera, 
And at this time, we usually go over the budget, which we are going to do today. And one of the reasons we do that is, in the past, we have done budget through committee, and it's done, and everything's done. And, but we, there was never a time when we stood in front of residents and do that. So for the past four years, I think, we've been doing this either virtually or in person, uh, so that you have an opportunity to hear the same thing um, that uh, we've gone through. Um, today's topics will be, and I'm slide, please. <coughs> The 20, fiscal year 2025 budget, that begins October 1. And an overview of that, our key program changes, introduction of new programs, and a terraces update, and then questions and answers. We are live streaming, we are recording. So if you're at home and you're looking at it now, it's great, and if you're not and you wanna see it later, it's fine. And Sarah, make sure it doesn't come on at my house on YouTube. <laughs> it's a very scary thing to hear yourself while you're making dinner. Um, and we certainly have time for questions and answers, but sometimes people don't want to ask questions in a room like this or they want to think about it. If you have a question and, and it doesn't get answered or you run out of time, there are index cards um, and, uh, available so you can write it down, leave it at the front desk, send me an email, send Karen an email. We will gather that and just make sure if there are any frequently asked questions, we will make sure that you get that. Already some folks have asked some questions and we've included them in this presentation today. So by way of an administrative um, overview, in 2025, you know, this, the story's kind of the same, the players are a little different. Uh, workforce challenges, that's what it's all about for all of us in a service industry and particularly healthcare. How do you find employees? How do you get employees? How do you retain employees? Are you competitive in the marketplace? Are you creating an environment that people want to be in? And, and how, do you, how do you impact that so that you can meet your service needs and your obligations? And let's face it, if, you don't, if we weren't before today, we certainly are construction weary. There's been some hammering, some nailing, some digging up, some chopping down going on for a long time. Um, and then the regulatory environment continues to be challenging. Uh, it's always fun when people who have never had to do this job create new regulations that have nothing to do with in reality. Um, they believe that there is a unicorn called an RN at every corner and that we will have them 24, 7, 10 deep. That's not gonna happen. And so coming up with alternatives and working with the feds and with the state to actually have realistic regulation has been important. Um, and that's just a side event, but it always impacts what we do and how we work. And then there's the challenge. Money is finite. And so uh, it's the issue of stewardship and resourcing. How do we best use the resources we have? How do we make sure we have the right resources? What are our investments? What are our outcomes? And how do we look at the whole picture? Because it's not just one thing, it's the whole ball of wax together. In today's presentation, we'll speak about our focus over the next year and pro providing an overview of our budget and operating plan, key operating expectations and outcomes, and strategic focus and implementation. But before I dive into that, I really want to talk a little bit about process because budget does not come fully formed. And I know my first community I worked in, the CFO basically, Reverend Kasky would go in his office He's passed, I can talk about him. He would go in his office, he would add 3% to the budget, and he'd come out and say, made a compli, done. That's not how we do it. The budget here starts in March, and it starts with looking at the first six months of operations. What have we been doing? What have we experienced? What is an anomaly? Are there changes? Are there contracts up for renewal? Has something changed, or is there something we need to do differently? Do we have the right people? Do we need more people? Do we need less people? Every director is responsible for taking a critical look at their department's operations at the six month mark compared to budget and also compared to what we have to do in the remaining of the year. Are there corrections we need to make? Are we experiencing some external changes that are gonna impact us? That's the first part, is looking at where we have been. The second is where do we want to go? We have a set of metrics that we have to meet. We meet them for operating under the compliance issues of the Department of Insurance. 
We have to meet the obligations of our bond financing. We have to meet the obligations of our budget and performance as approved by the board. So constantly we're looking at, as we go forward, how do we accomplish those things? There is no dictate for the budget. It's not the CFO or the COO or the CEO that says it will be thus. We throw it all in there and we look at it. And sometimes we cringe and sometimes we say, oh good, that worked. Um, but we're really looking to make sure what is the most sense that lets us meet the needs of the people in front of us and how can we best serve you. And keep in mind, our secondary stakeholder are all of our employees. So in as much as we meet your needs, we have to meet theirs. And our budget process, by virtue of the work that's put in, the investigation that's done, the assumptions that are made, and then the actual putting it together, um, we are able to handle both sides of that equation. So I would like to take a moment and turn this over to Karen, our CFO. Well, good evening. My name is Karen Henry, and I have served as the um, you don't have to do that yet. Served as the corporation's treasurer and CFO for the past 19 years. Um, I started when I was five. <laughs> <laughs> for those that are new residents, a short description of my role is I oversee all that is financial. Basically, anything that you can imagine that has a number on it, I'm probably a part of. I'm also responsible for financial reporting and compliance. Anita gave a very good overview of our process. This presentation is, you can kind of think of this as the final act of the play, um, because it may take us about 15 minutes or so to go over, but I can assure you that it took much longer than that to prepare. We just didn't simply change the dates on the fiscal year, and we were ready to go. The budget is a very deliberate process. Our team meets together to discuss and agree on the targets and assumptions that will be incorporated into the budget development. This is a team effort. Not one person or one department alone can do what needs to be done to fulfill our obligations and commitments. Therefore, we work together to establish these goals. So what are the key ingredients in the budget? First and foremost, each director develops their budget that includes the resources that are necessary to fulfill the obligations that are in your contract. We ask these questions. Have there been any changes to the contract or services that we would need to put into the budget? Have there been any changes in regulations Probably not. Reporting requirements or debt covenants? And what is the environment as it relates to staff resources and competition and pricing for goods and services? Here I'd like to take a pause and reflect and answer on one of those key questions. Over the past several years, we have seen an ever-increasing and growing workforce challenge in all the areas of service we provide service and hospitality jobs, technical and clinical jobs have struggled to attract candidates. The impact of low wages, pandemic-related realignment, and competition for the same people at entry level, as well as the shifting perspective of the workforce, this gig economy preference and declining population, have continuously challenged the forest we have been committed to a living wage threshold and realized that we could not have done this overnight or in a year. Over the past several years, we have made great strides to ensuring that entry-level positions, CNAs, key security, transportation, and dining staff were paid a living wage to remain competitive and is crucial for our retention of these employees. I am happy to report that with this year's budget, we have attained our goal. The forest is a service industry. 70% of the total operating budget is wages and benefits. Having the right people in the right place, paid competitively, and provided with the right training and support is necessary and critical to deliver quality services to our residents. 
This year's budget reflects that commitment to our staff and the residents we serve. 87% of the increase in the cost of operations, which is the direct expenses that are directly related to providing those services to you, were attributable to staffing. And we'll provide more detail later in the presentation. As we are a service industry, our work is never done. We will continue to audit for compensation levels within the industry and in the local geographic area for similar positions not in our industry. We will continue to review and assess wage and salary as well as role and function to ensure that we can hire competitively. I would like to take this opportunity as CFO to publicly give kudos to the leadership team for their hard work that they have done to deliver a budget amid these very challenging times that, number one, includes the resources necessary to fulfill service obligations promised to you in your contract, provides no degradation in the services we provide, maintains debt covenant and all other regulatory compliance and certifications, and maintains our financial strength and marketability. Talking about construction, please remember, those costs that are associated with building that beautiful building over there are not paid for with your monthly fees. So they had no impact on that whatsoever. They are paid for with the financing monies. First slide. So the leadership team met at the beginning of the budget process and built their budgets based on the key assumptions that you see here. We are projecting that 22 independent living move-ins will generate 6.2 million in entrance fees to pay for the debt service, refunds, and capital expenditures. This top-level summary of the total budget for fiscal year 2025 shows an increase in operating revenue of 3.6% and an increase in operating expenses of 3.4%, resulting in relatively no change to our net operating margin ratio. If any of you have attended my sessions in the Life at the Forest series, you would know that due to the type of contract that we offer, we are essentially an insurance product and we have an actuarial component to our pricing and financing. It's actuarial best practice to remain financially sound is to increase fees by at least the percent that the operating expenses increased. In the past, we were able to increase fees less than our operating expenses increased because the margin percentage remained at an acceptable level. In order to maintain our financial standing with the bondholders and the rating agencies, that ratio should not go below 11%. In this budget, we have maintained a positive ratio between growth in revenue and expense, maintained an acceptable margin, provides no degradation in services, nor in our financial standing. It maintains pricing, meets our debt covenants and rating compliance, and provide sufficient cash flow for capital spending needs. Having and maintaining this strong financial position really reaped big rewards when we went out to finance the new health center. If you remember, we achieved an excellent rate, 3.2% fixed for 30 years. Whew. A lot of other people out there that are trying to finance are like, we wish that was us. For the financing of phase two, the new independent living apartments in common areas, we also achieved a good rate. Through bank financing and a swap arrangement, we were able to secure 4.33%. The following reflects the key operating statistics that are incorporated into this budget. It's not just important to plan, but more importantly, is to have a means to track that performance and monitor to be able to make adjustments. This dashboard is reviewed monthly by our leadership team and is also included in the board's packet, package before each of their meetings. Financial success depends on three things, occupancy, expense control, and new independent living entrance fees. When all of these goals are met, 
we're able to pay our operating expenses, capital expenditures, and debt service without going into the savings account or our reserves. This slide gives an illustrated view in numbers of what success looks like. If occupancy is on target, then the independent living and healthcare fees will generate the operating revenue of 25.9 million to pay for the 22.9 million of operating expenses. If directors are within their budgets, the result will be 2.9 million in operating income that may be utilized to pay for the 2.5 million of capital expenditures. The budget assumes having 454,000 as a reserve for unanticipated capital expenses or other expenses, but we also maintain, as required by the Department of Insurance, a reserve of 6.5 million for any unforeseen events. I'd like to highlight that in over the last 30 years, we have never had to touch that reserve and we have been able to cover any unanticipated events within our annual operating budget. The debt service of 3.5 million, which is the total amount of interest and principal on the outstanding debt, is paid for by entrance fees from new independent living residents. Now let's talk about operating expenses. As I stated previously, keep in mind that the forest is a service industry. Therefore, it should be no surprise that 70% of the total operating expenses represent wages and benefits for our staff. Total operating expenses increased 756,000 from prior year's budget. In the next few slides, Anita and I will highlight the major drivers. Regarding um, general administrative, 40,000 or 5% of the operating expense increase were for costs associated with enhancing monitoring for security threats and maintaining compliance with HIPAA regulations regarding electronic information. Also, there were increases in the license fees for our financial system and electronic health record, and we have a new engagement portal that will replace Vibrant. Yahoo! We are very excited about this new system. They say, woo, oh, come on, people. We're very excited about this new system. It's called Cubigo. It's kind of a cute name. You will be hearing more about its implementation, so stay tuned. Anita? So I'll, I will walk you through the next slide, because 661,000 of the increase, um, it's really uh, speaks to employees and retention, recruitment, et cetera. Um, this year, we have provided for employees a cost of living increase of 3%. Since 2009, the cost of living increase had been 2.5% and had not been increased. This year, we did increase it because we do recognize certainly the challenges that our, our employees are facing, um, not only just, uh, just in general living and expenses, et cetera. Um, so we've adjusted and made sure that everybody has a living wage. We have a cost of living adjustment that everyone gets. And then we are able to recognize performance if certainly one um, exceeds expectations or occasionally or all the time. Um, we are also able to benefit that in um, an award uh, given for performance. So we've separated cost of living from performance. Um, recruitment initiatives. Room is full. The forest is full. We're 98% sold, right? 100% reserved and sold. Well, the issue is, why aren't we recruiting staff the way we recruit residents? Why aren't we going out to where people are and telling our story to them? Why aren't we meeting people halfway and creating the kind of energy, uh, telling our story, our success stories, and our opportunities? Why are we not making sure that everyone knows that we can help people attain their education through our scholarship funds, et cetera? So we have spent and set aside some money this year uh, to spend some time not only on a revamped advertising, but to do some radio, some ads. We're also looking after older workers who are looking for part-time work. So we are going out into the marketplace quite differently than we have, and it is not passively waiting 
uh, for people to cartwheel down for us to do drive and say, hey, I'm here, um, but rather really going out to meet people where they are and create some buzz about the opportunity and what can be done here. That has also been a factor of our creating working relationships also with Dorm Tech, with a couple of the certificate programs, and also some of the high schools. So we're continuing to do that. And in the rest of the year, we also anticipate working with uh, North Carolina Apprenticeship Program as ways so that we can create pathways for people to enter this field. Because if you work in a CCRC, there's almost no job or field that you can't do. Now, they don't let me do anything clinical because that's not safe. Um, but the rest of it, uh, people can do accounting, social services, um, media, marketing, dining, hospitality. There's a wide range of things and there are opportunities we need to tap into that so that people think of working here and it's not just, I can't go there, that's the nursing home. So we're educating the market. Um, and I'm gonna come back to the Employee Emergency Fund. This year's budget reflects 2.8 FTEs, full-time equivalents. So that's someone, that's 40 hours of work, so that's 80, 2,080 hours, yes. Um, so we have, and um, we added uh, healthcare uh, activities partners to really make sure that what's happening and filling out the team in each household and neighborhood in the health center. Um, we made, as I spoke earlier, the wage adjustments to dining and the florist at home. And um, we also added two CNAs because as our census has gone up, that has been the appropriate number that we've needed to add uh, to our and budget for in our operations. Also, we eliminated two jobs in the health center, um, a healthcare um, administrative manager and a part-time supervisor job that we found those duties were being handled in other ways. So that offset some of the increased costs. There was relatively small or little adjustment in other departments, really amounting to about 35,000. But one of the things that I am excited about is this year the board approved an employee emergency fund. We experienced, and we have various times during the course of my time here, we've experienced employees, team members who have had catastrophic events. And there's been no way to be of assistance. And uh, you know, you can kind of go fund me or the word gets around, but residents are put in the place of, I wanted to do something, but there wasn't a mechanism and I didn't want people to be in trouble. One of our residents was um, really helpful in helping to frame uh, how we might create an employee assistance fund. And it is for catastrophic illness or events uh, and where someone needs uh, help and assistance. And um, that was approved and funded, seed money funded by the board at 50,000. We've also received a $10,000 check um, in support of this fund. And the committee that will be administering that will include uh, uh, key members of the leadership team, resident representation, and a board member. So, and uh, those cases will be reviewed uh, when there's a request, et cetera, and it's anonymous for the person when they're doing the review. Uh, so, uh, and we're gonna work on getting that all set up. We've written and drafted the policy. We will implement that in um, January, but it will be available uh, and we'll have information with much more detail as we go forward. But the big hurdle was actually getting it funded and having a way to proceed. So uh, we are grateful for that. <coughs> So the other residents, so you know we're um, food and all the stuff that goes with it, how you fix it, how you clean the kitchen, how you get the refrigerator going, all that stuff. We saw an increase of about $103,000, um, so that's up about 14, nope, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong line, uh, 62000 and um, health services, med supplies, you would say, how can that go down? Well, after the first year of operation and the tracking of data that we had, we were able to, with certainty, establish the cost per patient day. And so we were able to budget with a known entity and it actually reduced our cost because that's what we're actually spending. So uh, Leanne and Kayla, thank you. That's good research, girls. It's awesome, thank you.
Um, and then um, maintenance and grounds, we see an increased supply and repair. Housekeeping, only a marginal increase. Again, the biggest thing we're facing there is the cost of supplies, chemicals, paper, uh, plumbing supplies are through the roof. Um, we try not to keep a whole lot of stuff on the shelf, but um, we also have to have the stuff we need, um, and it's all going up. The good news is, and, and Nathan, I thank you for this, um, but the good news is, is that we have multiple contracts with people. We have multiple providers, so that if we can't get what we want at the price we want, we certainly are able to go out in the marketplace and negotiate, or if somebody doesn't have what we need, we can go elsewhere. So we're not locked in, and the answer of you can't have this till X, Y, Z just really isn't an answer. Now, we still have supply chain issues, and there's still stuff that's not there, and you can call for a service person, and, you know, it's an interesting world these days. You can call and say, I have work, I have money, we pay when you write the invoice, and they don't call you back. Or they show up and say, that's really nice. They'll bid on it. And then they don't call you back. Um, the forest is known as someone that we pay our bills when they come in. We don't do the 45-day delay. Um, so if you're working with us, you know you're going to get paid. And still, people act a fool and don't come back. So, but Nathan, um, again, always seems to have someone in his back pocket. And we are able to get done what we need to get done. And then uh, certainly some of our contracts, it's just normal contract stuff that went up, nothing unusual um, there, but also some more resident entertainment. As we do more and bringing more people in, you know, um, if everything you do is free, everything you do is free. Sometimes that's not exactly what you had in mind. So we have used money to actually pay for some performers and some things that we want to do so that we can continuously improve some of the offerings and create some diversity and variety in how we do those things. And then, fortunately, utilities and miscellaneous, that's general insurance and uh, the um, uh, uh, directors and officers and those kinds of things, that actually went down, but primarily because of good workers' comp experience um, so that we saw um, a, a lesser rate going through and just really good experience rates across the board. So here I'd like to highlight um, some key operating statistics that we focus on operationally. Um, days cash on hand. This represents the number of days of cash that's available to pay operating expenses. 120 days is required for bond compliance. Our bank lender, Truist, requires 250. And Fitch looks at a range between 500 and 700. Our actuals have ranged from 570 to 850 days. That's about two years. So we have budgeted a target of 550 days. Debt service coverage ratio is another very important ratio. Lenders and rating agencies are very interested in this because it tells them how many times you are able to pay the interest and principal on your debt with cash that we generate from our operations, not from investments or donations. This number also includes entry fee um, proceeds, less any refunds paid. 1.2 times is required for debt compliance. Our actuals have ranged from 2.6 to 4.3. Our budget has a target of 2.5. This is in line with the feasibility studies that were included in the two recent financings. Additions to the wait list. Our marketing and sales team has a target of 80, which they have surpassed this year. It's around 100 and some. <laughs> Ooh. This is essential because it will ensure we have a ready and available list of people to draw upon when a residence becomes available. And please note that this list is totally separate from um, the Terrace's wait list. They're two separate ones. So in summary, we spoke about a lot of things this evening, and I don't expect you to remember everything, but I'd like you to take away these few things. The board just approved a budget that's fiscally responsible and provides the resources that are necessary um, for your contract as well as meets all of our obligations. We are in a good financial position. 
which is validated by independent outside parties that responded favorably to two of our financings, and also the market has responded favorably um, to our new independent living apartments, which April will talk about. And all costs that are related to building the building are not paid by your fees. Please remember that. <laughs> they are paid for by the monies from the financings. Thank you for your attention, and I'll turn it back to Anita. All right, so there's, um, next slide, there's a few things that have changed or are different or we're really focused on. Uh, we've talked a little bit about Cubigo. We've heard about Cubigo. I know that Sarah is so glad that she can say Cubigo is coming um, because Sarah does good research. I mean, you want to know something about something, she's going to ask every question. I'm, gonna go, I'm like, Max, no. And she's like, no, well, one more thing. So, um, but we have settled on it. It is getting rolled out and we, we appreciate, we think that this is a much more user-friendly system. It's integrating across platforms on our campus and it really positions us to have a better way of communicating and, and taking care of business here as we become more. Uh, we continue to see expansion in programs and services. We also are starting to see um, some uh, connection, not only in independent living, but with our health center and pathways to which we can coordinate and maximize the opportunities for all of our residents wherever they live. And I really applaud the work between your team and Jen's team and really coming to make that happen. And in community services, it's really about looking at do we have the right mix of things? I think the biggest thing that's a change there um, in community services is we did change this year um, the pricing on trips and that because we charge less for a trip, less than it costs for a gallon of gas. Um, not our smartest thing. And in addition to that, we bring staff in. And when you bring staff in for a special event, you just don't bring them in for two hours. By law, you bring them in for four. So we had to at least, we're not trying to make money, but we are trying to cover our costs, all right? And to make uh, some clarity and have some fairness about that. Um, the Forest at Home, Takitha has done a really good job. You have been out there and you have really helped people to know that the Forest at Home can do so much more than clinical intervention. That it's an assist, it's a help, it can be short term, it can be long term. We want to meet you where you are and Takitha will meet you anywhere. Is that how it works? Um, but again, we see growth in the program and it's appropriate growth. You have, are building a solid staff and we're moving forward, so thank you. Um, the Early Acceptance Program, April and her team have been out there tapping into some new markets. Some of those markets are people who have already chosen where they want to live, but they haven't chosen their future health care. And so they are, we are doing some memberships and expanded memberships into the Early Acceptance Program, which is healthy for us and is, provides a service. As we know, many of the people in the Early Acceptance Program actually are moving into the campus next year, and some have already done so. Thank you. Now, the health center and health services. One of the things we did this year, and this is organizationally quite big. Um, you know, if you have every discipline that works anywhere on this campus also works in the health center, whether it's food, housekeeping, maintenance, um, uh, laundry, you name it, uh, as well as the clinical services, the programming services, et cetera. And sometimes, if you have 59 bosses in 49 places, you have a lot of different variations on a theme. And so we actually coalesced and put everything together under one umbrella in health services. Um, the leadership team has split to provide um, uh, support and uh, discipline support as well as uh, professional support, education, and follow through. Uh, and really being able to take the long view of the health center Leanne will be managing that as well as the short term. Her management team is in place, but also going across disciplines so that the accountability is clear, the outcomes are clear, and the expectation is clear. Um, and very excited. Um, that's an opportunity. It's the right thing to do, and we're at the right place to begin to do that. So, um, and we'll always keep evolving in those areas. I spoke about the Employee Emergency Fund, which I, I am so grateful uh, to the board and to our residents for their support there. 
And then I also want to give kudos and thanks to the resident association and the many committee members as we talk about the residents moving in uh, to the terraces and uh, the willingness to be thoughtful and forward thinking about how we make that a good process. You know, there's always going to be more residents than there are staff. So we have to be in partnership. We have to think together. Um, and it won't be a surprise to some of you if somebody's got a real hankering to do something. That's Leanne's word. She taught me that, hankering. Um, but if you have something you really, really want to do, I would invite you. Please be the president of that club. We will help you. We'll book the space. But in order to do the things that you want to do, if it's really important to you, let's talk about it. Because it can't all fall on staff. We don't have enough. But we can do things together that expand what our options are and create other opportunities. And I know that somebody spoke to me, I don't know if they're in the room, about an Italian club, a conversational Italian club. And I looked at them and said, good, you're going to be the president? And, you know, but the thing is, I want people to hear that that is an opportunity and it does expand our opportunities. Um, and that's certainly what we will posit in front of um, our new residents as well which doesn't mean we won't have things that we traditionally do, but as we become more diverse in our interests and activities and desires, then we're gonna need some help and some participation and partnership. And we look forward to that. So, um, and I do want you to know um, something that just flew out of my head. It's just completely gone. I'm gonna let you talk and maybe it'll come back. I got nothing. <laughs> Well, good evening, everyone. I love seeing all of the familiar faces here tonight. But if I haven't met you yet, I am April Ravelli, the Director of Sales and Marketing here at The Forest. And I am thrilled to give you an update on our Phase Two construction project, commonly known as the Terraces, as we enter into what feels like rounding third base. Our site is on home. I can see it. My email inbox is almost back to normal. <laughs> One more year. So where are we? Uh, so in December of 2022, we actually were 100% pre-sold. All 71 apartments had a binding deposit. We threw a little party. The sales counselors felt really good. Uh, but we knew we had talked to other communities who had done expansions of this size, so we were prepared. Uh, and as many of us know here, uh, construction is long. And so we have had apartments returned back into available inventory since the end of 2022. This can happen for a variety of reasons. You may have met some of your new neighbors who were originally signed on for the terraces but they were offered something sooner and they chose to come on and we're so glad they did. Uh, and then, you know, that daughter that lived here that you were moving to be close to, maybe she took a job in Michigan. I feel so sorry for that couple. Uh, they're, they're going to Michigan. Um, so again, things change. And so we knew that and we continued marketing the terraces uh, because we knew that things would come back in. So that's the important information for me to share with you when you open Durham Magazine and you're like, why do I still see this ad for the terraces? April said they were pre-sold. That's why. Uh, so we've been continuing to market them. So as of today, we have four apartments available and I still have 30 folks that haven't yet received a first offer. As Anita explained, we have our, our future residency program, what we call our general wait list. All of you were probably on it, right, to come into the forest. We keep a separate wait list for the terraces because we really wanted to know these are folks that really want to move into this new building. We've had over 200 folks be charter members. Some of them got an offer and did a deposit. Some of them got an offer and said, oh, it's not what I want, or actually it's too soon, and they passed. And then other folks are still waiting. Some of those folks who passed, I will tell you that they have called me and said, will I get a second offer? What do I have to do to get a second offer? <laughs> um, I don't know if we'll make second offers, but it's a good thing to have folks ready. So we'll see. 
As we continue into the fall, you may start seeing what we call terrace depositors, which are just your future neighbors, at special events here on campus. We know that you will welcome them as you have all welcomed each other and continue to do so. I personally have had the pleasure of working alongside the Residents Association, as well as a small subcommittee uh, that represents mentors, life at the forest, and more. Uh, and we're working on plans of how do we orient 71 move-ins at one time. We do an average of 22 to 25 a year, right? I mean, we've had a year where we did 30, um, but that wasn't all at one time. So it's a, it's a fun challenge, and of course, as we did with the pre-sales, we are reaching out to our uh, friends and other communities who have done expansions of this size, learning about best practices, uh, and I personally feel very confident uh, with our plans for a smooth move-in, smooth transition, and getting folks into being a forester. Not the ter I don't live in the terraces, I live in the forest, and we're all part of that same community. So what can you do? Uh, be welcoming, as I said, but also consider signing up to be a mentor when Rose Mills puts out the call. Rose is traveling right now. She doesn't know I'm saying this. If you haven't met Rose, she's a resident here. <laughs> she's going to put out the call for mentors. She's gonna need more than she currently has. So think about if that's something you would be interested in doing. And then of course, just be open to making new friends. That's it. Many of you know the depositors. They know a lot of folks here. Many of them are coming from the area. So that shouldn't be a, a hard stretch. As I tell the depositors at least once a day, at least, it's too, it's too soon to share a move-in date. I can't tell you. But we continue to anticipate it to be summer of 2025. Construction is a process, but we feel grateful to have Whiting Turner as our partners and they're very communicative, which is great. The building is really starting to look like a building, you guys. The connections are being made, the roof is on, the outside and the insulation are coming together, retaining walls are set. All of that means a lot more to Nathan and his crew than it does to me. I just say things like, it looks really good. <laughs> I'm so excited. Uh, but really, I thank you for your attention. As I said, we're rounding third base. Home plate is there, um, and I just thank you, as Anita shared, for your support and your willingness to welcome new folks to our campus. We're closer than we've ever been before, so thank you. You almost made me forget it again. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that whole where are my keys standing in the middle of the room happens more often than it ever used to. Um, what I wanted to tell you is that this presentation will be in, in, in fully available in the connections room and in the library uh, as copies for you and uh, to have that available. Um, I would like to a, thank everybody who presented, but I also want to open it up for questions. And do we have a working mic? Oh, darn. Okay. So we're a little skittish. <laughs> we hear an alarm. <laughs> it's all systems go. <laughs> or not. Do we know what it is, Lair? Yeah. Leanne, come on down. Come on back. Come on back. It's all OK. Um, that was not our alarm system. It probably was an amber lake alert, unless it's raining or something. I don't know. But uh, they haven't. OK. Four miles away, all right. We're good, <laughs> all right? We are good. Okay, thank you, we're good, all right. Gosh, that's a little PTSD, isn't it? Yeah, 
All right, so uh, uh, Sarah has the mic, and we can take questions if you have them. Okay, Miss Tom, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> It's on. Oh, there we go. I get my walking shoes on. If you say it, I'll repeat it loud. I do not believe that the board has chosen to do that. I suspect, at least at this juncture, they probably will not. However, they do, through their finance committee, look at operations and the expectation. And yes, um, this was never not, I'm not trying to be flippant, please do not hear it that way. Um, the expectation is that this is, this is not the cheapest place to be but there's a reason because of the scope of services that we provide, which are different than many CCRCs. But if you look, we're pretty commensurate in the market with everyone else. We try to be really careful about increases. We try to make sure we have gone out of staff with limited positions. We have looked critically at contracts on an annual basis. We look at our FTEs to make sure that we're not hiring over and we manage the day-to-day -day operations so that we're looking at overtime, we're looking at what do you need to deliver. We, um, the one budget I never cut is food, raw food. I won't cut it because raw food, it goes up, it goes down. I do not want to degrade the quality of what we buy. And that's important to me. Um, but I do think that the fiduciary responsibility of the board is well honed. Um, that they have looked for 32 years at all of our operations and really made that assessment. Um, I know that the only time we've brought in an outside auditor was to look at some clinical services, and that was about seven years ago. So I can't answer your question affirmatively, but that is the answer I have. Uh, you want somebody besides me to answer your question. And that's okay. Sure. Chuck, would you like to answer that? So, in full disclosure, this is my first year as the board chair, and I follow in big shoes with Dave Pottinger. Um, if Dave ever asks you to go to lunch, don't go because he's going to ask you to do something. That's how I got involved. Um, but Dave and I are good friends. What I can tell you from a board perspective is what you saw tonight was kind of a glimpse. So Nathan presented his portion of the budget, Leanne, April, Karen, um, Rashad. Um, I can tell you that after each person presented, there were a significant number of questions from board members. Um, asking for justification on why we're doing certain things. Um, at the end of the day, from the board's perspective, we feel our number one obligation <clears throat> is to the residents, and number two is to the employees. And what do we need to do to make sure that we take care of the residents and we take care of the employees? And as Karen presented today, uh, and I'll give credence, uh, kudos to Karen. Karen 
massages the numbers. She watches them. We know where every dime is going. So we did look at that, and the board did approve unanimously the budget. Um, in full disclosure, we have not had any conversations about hiring an all outside agency to come in uh, to oversee anything um, like, like you were requesting. Thank you. Other questions? Tom? Um. Is this working? Yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> yes. uh, and following up on the uh, uh, announced uh, increase in monthly fees, which we all just got, I think, I took a look today at operations through the first 10 months of the year, mm -hmm. and I saw that in the health center, we were $700,000 below budget on the revenue side and $500,000 above budget on the expense side, which is a total of about $1.2 million. Uh, are we doing anything to address uh, increased occupancy and or reduce costs? Yes, we have. Um, and actually, we have taken in and continue to take in outside admissions into the health center. We also experienced a period in the middle of the year where we had a ter uh, terrible surfeit or lack of staffing. We had to use agency, which agency is a, a cost over and above what we have. So we had a multitude of things in the same place. We are further restricted by the idea that we can only take a direct admission into assisted living. An assisted living admission comes in, they pay a small entry fee and they pay the full per diem. It's the only place that we can build census. Nobody's running through the hall prematurely moving our residents into skilled care or assisted living. Um, and the reality is, is a lot of our contemporaries are struggling with census and we're fortunate and the only way that we can build census is outside admissions. Uh, we have a good pipeline. We have a resident navigator who's doing that. We have relationships with discharge planners. Um, those are usually not emergency decisions, so they take longer, and some of them we can't take because one thing is you have to be financially qualified to be here. We do not participate in Medicaid, so you actuarially have to be able to pay for the cost of care for your presumed lifetime, and um, uh, no Medicaid, student lifetime, and your direct admission, and we cannot take admissions such as persons who have Lewy body dementia or frontal, temporal, frontal, frontal, temporal dementia. Yes, but we can't do that because we are not equipped to provide care on those diagnoses. And so uh, it's a delicate dance, but we have gotten up to 72% from 50 some percent in assisted living. Uh, with the last two admissions, and we continue to have that pipeline. So I expect that to, one, to be better in this budget, and we looked at that in the planning. The other uh, issue that I plan, uh, that we have planned is um, the ongoing recruitment of staff, but we've actually stabilized, so we don't have the open positions and are eliminating, working through getting rid of agency, except on rare occasions. But we're still gonna have some agency, we're still gonna have things that we can't always fill, and we're not going to run with less than the required staffing. So it's a dance you do, and it's one that you cannot mitigate when you don't have the freedom to take in a lot of admissions. But I expect it to be better. We're monitoring it every week. We're looking at our hours every month. We're looking at positions filled, positions vacated, and really marching toward targets so that we can make sure that that's met. And even with that deficit or less revenue and the higher expenses, we still were able to operate without having to go into the bank because there were other costs that we were able to manage. So it's not perfect, but it's a work in progress, and we spend our time doing it. So, um, Understandably, during the period of construction, the campus has fallen into something of a mess. Uh, and I'm wondering whether, when the dust settles, and uh, is there a plan to um, improve the landscaping and the campus in general? And who will be responsible? Is that 
going to be directional landscaping or will that be under somebody else's um, contract? So the work that we do post-construction is to go around the campus, all the work that you don't do now because it's going to be torn up. And so under Nathan's uh, direction, that will happen. And if he chooses directional landscape, that's who will do it. And if he doesn't, I mean, that is his purview and his expertise. But indeed, there are things that we won't do until the construction is finished. And that includes some of the landscaping and, and refixing that. There's some pavement work and some sidewalk work and some tree removal. So those are things that have to happen. But they have season time in place. But we do have the resources to do them. And we will be addressing that. Anything else? All right, seconds from a clean getaway. Um, if you have other questions, or if you, and you are thinking of something, or you get home and it's still bothering you, write it down, send an email, make a call, and, and we will answer it. If it, if it rises to the level of, a, of um, frequently asked questions, we'll make sure it's there. And we also, uh, all of us as leadership team, use all of our committees from the Resident Association as a means of communicating um, uh, information changes, et cetera. So don't hesitate. All I will tell you is you can tell by my memory now that if you stop me in the parking lot and tell me something, I will really remember it until I get in my car. So let's just take the time and get it in a place where I can get a hold of it and we can get back to you and it's just not a pass through. I thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you for being here. Okay.